Heading into the last quarter of the 1800s, no city on earth was better positioned for commercial dominance than this one. The capital of the Midwest had just fueled the Union's victory in the Civil War, and its high concentration of industries situated along its many rail lines, vast lakefront, and re-engineered river was attracting thousands of new arrivals every month. But in their rush to expand as quickly as possible, its builders had inadvertently made conditions just right for disaster. This is part two of the making of modern Chicago, once the fastest growing city in history. As we learned in part one, Chicago was the world's largest market for lumber. Not only did it supply its rapidly increasing population with boards and planks for their homes, but it also stored huge quantities of wood awaiting shipment to towns popping up all over the western prairies. A city is built without any concern for nature, without any concern for the realities of the prairie. Prairies burn. It's just, it's built because it's built for money. Do it quickly, make a buck, move on. And of course the city is built so much out of wood. The streets are wood. The bridges are wood. It's so hot that the tar on some of the roofs starts to blister in the sun. After an extremely dry summer, on an October night in 1871, a strong wind blew into Chicago from the west. Mystery still surrounds exactly what happened next, but somehow a fire started in a barn and quickly spread to other structures. A few minutes later, a huge explosion rocked the north side of the river after a spark landed in a railroad car filled with kerosene. The extreme heat generated by tens of thousands of tons of highly flammable materials all over the city, combined with the whipping wind, created its own weather system. The scariest thing about the fire was the wind that the fire created. Convection whirls, they were called. They spin and spin and spin, creating a tornado effect. And then these tornadoes would come and they'd hit a building and they take the roof off a building and deposit it a quarter of a mile away. The wooden city went up like a tinderbox. To escape a certain death, thousands of terrified residents waded into the lake and stayed there all night. When the sun finally rose, illuminating a black, smoke-filled sky, the scope of the devastation was clear. Over 17,000 buildings and 73 miles of streets were suddenly gone. Incredibly, only about 300 people perished, but over 100,000 were instantly homeless, a third of the city's population. It was one of the worst fire disasters in modern history. But some nearby areas fared even worse. The same windstorm fueled major fires all around the Great Lakes, most tragically in Peshtigo, Wisconsin, a town engulfed so suddenly that 2,500 people died and 1.5 million acres of surrounding forest burned. Cut off from the rest of the world when its telegraph lines were charred and eclipsed by the magnitude of property loss in Chicago, the little-known Peshtigo fire is still the deadliest blaze in American history. Despite the apocalyptic scene in their metropolis, many Chicagoans not only stayed, but vowed to quickly rebuild. Fire provides a mythology. Chicago's gonna rise out of the ashes, uh, does arise out of the ashes. How much of the city is actually burned? Well, you know, only a small part of the actual city is burned, but that's not the way we think about the fire. You couldn't take away Chicago's geography. It was still the gateway to the American West. Its railroads weren't destroyed. It still had these lines of track that were gonna deliver its commodities to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. I visited with the Chicago History Museum's director of exhibitions to learn more. What many people don't realize is that it left the west side and the south side largely unscathed. And that was really important when it came to Chicago's ability to quickly rebuild. Because what you had on the west and the south side were not only two-thirds of the city's population living there, but you had the bulk of the city's industries. But a lot of the lumber yards, that's where you had the steel mills, supplies that could still come into the city because the railroad network was also still largely in place after the fire. 
Many of the city's most prominent residents wasted no time trying to jumpstart the rebuilding process. However, bankers in New York were wary of losing their investments in another fire. To assuage their concerns, Chicago quickly adopted new building codes that mandated the use of less flammable materials like brick and terracotta, setting the stage for the largest construction boom in American history and a new architectural era. Hemmed in by water on three sides and railroad yards to the south, there was nowhere in the city's central loop district to build but up. Two innovations made the skyscraper possible, elevators and structural steel. In 1885, the first steel-framed high-rise building in the world rose in Chicago. Instead of having a structure where all the weight is in the walls and it's kind of holding the structure together, in Chicago, architects began experimenting with using a steel skeleton or an iron skeleton or a frame that you can more or less then hang the exterior of the building on. And that allows you to create much more dynamic, lighter and more flexible structures that can go significantly higher. You also get a lot more ornamentation. The exterior becomes less functional and more artifice. There's also though innovations in glass manufacturing and in Chicago architects are some of the first architects to kind of experiment with using increasingly larger plates of, of glass which allows more natural light to come in. The start of the skyscraper age has transformed not only this city, but our entire planet. Today, Chicago still ranks among the tallest and densest skylines in the world. But the inception of this period of development was a spectacle of organized chaos. The soot coming off the street, this cloud of smoke hanging over the city, the rush of people, this cavalry charge on the streets, streetcar lines all over the place, trolleys going along, the skyscrapers going up, a story every three days. The people are watching like urban shows. The sound of rivet guns, which are just invented at the time, bang, 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 of the rivet systems. It just seemed like one vast construction site. Amidst this swirl of activity in 1893, Chicago hosted the Columbian Exposition, also known as the World's Fair. Built on over 600 acres of former marshland at the present location of Jackson Park, the fairgrounds drew 27.5 million visitors over six months at a time when the population of the entire country was just over 60 million. Its exhibits projected American optimism, boosted Chicago's image as the country's industrial capital, and had a profound cultural influence, especially in architecture and the arts. Just 20 years after the fire, Chicago had rebuilt to make its debut on the biggest stage. The thing that's remarkable is how kind of quickly it came into being. The sort of concerted effort that had to go into its design and, and construction, and then also its organization as well. You had iron or steel substructures, and then you had draped over it these exteriors that were made of a material called staff, which is basically a kind of plaster that can easily be shaped and molded and manipulated. And that's how you created something that looked more or less like marble with all of these ornamentations, but it wasn't a particularly permanent material. Despite relying on a little illusion, Chicago's ability to pull off an event of this scale was miraculous. Eric Larson documented the feverish preparations to get ready for opening day in his brilliant book, The Devil in the White City, which tells the true story of the prominent architect in charge of realizing the fair's grand vision. To build the fair, Daniel Burnham had confronted a legion of obstacles, any one of which could have, should have killed it long before opening day. Together, he and his architects had conjured a dream city whose grandeur and beauty exceeded anything each singly could have imagined. Visitors wore their best clothes and most somber expressions as if entering a great cathedral. Some wept at its beauty. Whole villages had been imported from Egypt, Algeria, Dahomey, and other far-flung locales, along with their inhabitants. 
The street in Cairo exhibit alone employed nearly 200 Egyptians. Everything about the fair was exotic and, above all, immense. A single exhibit hall had enough interior volume to have housed the U.S. Capitol, the Great Pyramid, Winchester Cathedral, Madison Square Garden, and St. Paul's Cathedral, all at the same time. It's difficult to overstate how influential this period was for Chicago's rise to dominance as an urban center, just as the rest of the country was emerging as a global power. At the time of the fire in the early 1870s, the city had a population of about 300,000. But by the time of the 1893 World's Fair, Chicago had grown to a city of over a million residents. It had surpassed Philadelphia as the second largest city in the country. At that point in time, no city in the history of the world had gotten big so quickly as Chicago. It had actually become the fourth largest city by population in the entire world. By the end of the 1890s, you had London, New York, Paris, Chicago. Those were the four largest global cities. Thanks for watching. In part three, we look at how Chicago's forward thinking leaders positioned it for success today and in the future.